What is going on, everybody? I hope everybody is having an amazing day out there, and I'm going to hit you guys up with another tutorial video. I know recently my Logic video got a lot of steam, and a lot of people have seemingly been liking it, uh, so I figured that I would do something along that line again. Now, for this video, I'm going to be behind the camera so that I can give you guys a little bit more of a more in-depth visual look at what I'm doing at the keyboard. Also, my camera that I've been using has been out of commission for some time. Still have to replace it. But nonetheless, I'm here and we're going to be looking at jazz. Now, the reason for this is because if you go on YouTube right now and you try to look up how to play jazz, uh, it's very, very hard to narrow down a specific set of principles or rules to use to get that jazzy sound. Oftentimes what you're going to find is you're going to find a scale to use, a progression to use, and that's pretty much about it. There's really no talk about the theory behind what's going on. There's no talk about the mindsets. So that is something that I aim to hit with this video. Now, some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about is a little bit theory heavy, and I'll try to kind of catch you guys up as I talk about some of the things that I'm going to talk about. But I'm going to also include links down in the description for videos that are much more in-depth and can give you much more of an intimate understanding of the principles that we're going to be using so you don't feel as intimidated when you're tackling jazz. So the first thing that you really should have a familiar understanding with is at least two keys. Now, throughout the video, I'll try as best as I can to stick in the key of C and the key of F. So keys are basically a set pattern of what you need to play and what you don't need to play when you're going from one note to another note. So if we're looking at the key of C, obviously we're talking about C and we're going to go to C. Now, as we go to C, we're going to have a set key pattern of what we need to press to go from one C to another C. So from basically to keep it simple and to keep it fast, from C to C, you hit all white keys. So all the white keys in the middle, you're going to press to go from C to the top C. Now in terms of F, the key of F, it's going to be the exact same thing, only the fourth scale degree, meaning one, two, three, four, that white key isn't going to be in the pattern. It's actually going to be the key just to the left, the black key, the flat key. So basically, this is B and this is B flat. So we're going to go from F to F, hitting all white keys except for B, which is going to be flatted. All right. So scale degrees is kind of something that I tapped on a little bit. So basically, F is 1. The scale is the same thing as what the key is going to be. So if I talk about the key of F, the first scale degree is going to be F. G is going to be the second scale degree. A is going to be the third scale degree. B flat, and the key of F is going to be the fourth scale degree. Five, six, seven, and then it starts back on one because this is F, and F is one. Same thing in the key of C. We're going to start on C, which is the first key scale degree, and then we're going to go two, three, four, five, six, seven, and start back at one, all right? So that's basically a kind of simple breakdown about what scale degrees are. Now, chord scale degrees are basically the same type of deal, so we're just building chords off the scale degrees. So if we talk about the one chord, we're talking about C, which is the first scale degree, a chord built on C, which is the first scale degree. If we're gonna talk about the fourth, chord, the four chord, then we're going to find the four scale degree, one, two, three, four, and build a chord off of it. Now, it can be major or minor, something that we're going to talk about a little bit later on, excuse me, but it has the same principle. Uh, same thing with the fifth scale degree, that's the five chord, six chord, seven chord, so on and so forth, all right? So that's basically how scale degrees and chord degrees work in their own separate keys, all right? Uh, and knowing C and F is going to benefit you a lot. The next thing is seventh chords. You really need to know a lot about seventh chords in jazz, which is also something that we're going to touch on later. So basically, we're going to have a chord. So let's say we're in the key of F, and we're playing an F. What we're going to do is we're going to include the seventh scale degree, all right? Seventh scale degree. That's basically a seventh chord, and there are different types of seventh chord this, uh, chords that you need to be familiar with. So this is a major seventh because the seventh scale degree is within the key of C, right? It's a white key. It isn't this one. 
which is flat. It's in the key of F. We play it as we're going through the major scale. So if it fits within the key of F, it's going to be a major seventh. Now, if we flat the seventh, all of a sudden it is a dominant seventh. Anytime you see in tablature or sheet music, anything like that, if it says F7, just F with seven beside it, this is what they're talking about right here. Basically, the seventh scale degree is flatted, all right? If we uh, take the third scale degree right here and we flat it, all of a sudden it becomes a minor seventh, all right? And basically, that is how this all functions. So major seven, dominant seven, or just normal seventh. Moving the third down one, a half step, makes it a minor seventh. And then what we do after that is we get into the diminished chords. So there are two levels of diminished chords. The first level of diminished chords is you take a minor seventh and you flat the fifth. So we just flatted the third. Now we're going to flat the fifth and we're going to keep the seventh the same. This is going to be a level one diminished that is also called a half diminished. All right. The next uh, degree of diminished that we're going to talk about is called a fully diminished seventh and in my experience it's much more broadly used than the half diminished and what that's going to be is basically the seventh that has been flatted ever since the dominant or normal seventh uh, way back when we started this we're going to flat it so we have that all right so to do a quick recap major seventh because the seventh scale degree is in the key that we're talking about when you flat the seventh it becomes a dominant seventh or a normal jazz seventh move down the third a half step it becomes a minor seventh flat the fifth it becomes a level one half diminished seven chord take the seventh and flat it again and it becomes a fully level two diminished chord, all right? That's basically uh, the seventh chords. There's also an augmented chord. Basically, if you have a normal chord and you move the fifth up instead of moving it down like we did for half diminished, that's going to be an augmented chord, but we're not really going to talk about it in this video, so it's not as important to know about. So that is basically how the seventh chords work and function in the key of F. Same thing in the key of C if you were to transpose all that to the key of C. All right. So those scale degrees, chord degrees, uh, knowing the key of C and the key of F and being familiar with the seventh chords are going to be something that's very helpful with continuing with the principles in this video that we're going to get into. All right. So now we'll hop into the actual five principles that you should know to get the jazzy sound and I hope you guys enjoy. All right, everyone. So the first principle that we're going to talk about to get that jazzy sound that everybody likes and listen to at the beginning of this video, we're going to add sevenths to everything. All right. So as an example, what I'm going to take is I'm going to take just a normal chord progression and we're going to keep it as diatonic as possible. And what diatonic means is diatonic simply means that we're going to stay in the key of whatever key we're in. We're not going to move outside and we're not going to play alterations or accidentals as some people call them. We're just going to stick in the key of what we are playing. So the example that I'm going to take is Dearly Beloved. Number one, because it's simple and number two, because it's beautiful. Um, and it's something that not a lot of people would consider to be jazzy per se. So Dearly Beloved, the progression is really simple. It's a 4-5-1 progression. It's in the key of E flat. So we have an A flat chord, a B flat chord, and then a one chord for E flat. Very simple, very beautiful, amazing, amazing piece of music. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a major seventh to the chord progression as much as possible. Now, this is what it would be with the major seventh added to A flat, right? Now, the B flat is going to be a little tricky simply because if we did a major seventh, all of a sudden we're playing an A and we're outside of the key of E flat, 
which has an A flat in the scale. So we can't do that. So we can either do B flat seven, just a normal seven, or we can do what's called a six chord, which is very simple. Basically, we just have the normal major scale or minor scale. It can work in minor too. And we just include the sixth scale degree on top of that. So it's really simple. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the six chord simply because it's not as crunchy for a lot of people and we're going to try to keep it as simple as possible to show how adding these extensions can make something sound uh, really jazzy so that's that and then e flat major seven would be that so what we get is we get this with no extensions just played and by adding extensions we can turn that into this and one more time I'll roll the chords so you can get a little bit of a feel for each note Hopefully you guys can hear that that makes a big, big difference in the sound just by adding sevenths and in the case of the B flat, a six. The second thing that we'll do is we will add the same thing to the river flows in you, which is another type of popular piece of music that people wouldn't consider jazzy. New age music is very diatonic and it's also very repetitive. So. River Flows in U is normally played in F sharp minor, and the chord progression is six, four, one, and five, just like that. All right, and if we add extensions, what we do is we get F sharp minor seven, really jazzy, love that chord. We're gonna get a D major seven. We're gonna get an A major seven. And then we're gonna get an E minor major seven, just like that, all right? Now with this, E minor, or E major rather, we can't actually do that. You guys know why? Give you a second. It's because this E flat, or D sharp, however you want to look at it, is not in the key of F sharp minor. And the key of F sharp minor, we don't have a D sharp, all right? So what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna make it a six chord also very jazzy. All right, so with these extensions, it sounds like this. Hopefully you can hear how that gives it a much, much jazzier sound simply by adding in those extensions. So just like any other piece of music or genre of music, jazz is very, very heavily reliant upon chord progressions. Now, chord progressions is kind of, we looked at with these examples, can be made jazzy, quote unquote, by adding those sevenths and six extensions to them to give them that sound. Now, a lot of you might be asking, well, how do I make up? chord progressions, how do I get chord progressions because I can't just go and take a lot of pop progressions and make them, you know, sound jazzy because they weren't made with that intention, although that is something that you could do. And the answer to that is basically to look up jazz standards. Now, jazz standards are going to be pieces of jazz repertoire that are played by a lot of jazz musicians and performed a lot by jazz musicians. If you go to Google and type in jazz standards, you can find a lot of jazz standards that will give you 
chord progressions with those extensions and with those jazzy makeups that make them jazz standards. Another thing that you can do is you can look up the real book, R-E-A-L book. It is a book that you can get on Amazon for like 30 bucks and it has a boatload of jazz standards with those chord progressions that you can play, improvise over, do a bunch of stuff with, and then those can give you those jazzy chord progressions that you can play. One progression that I like to use a lot to improvise over and to kind of get the jazzy sound from is actually this. One major seven, we'll do it in the key of F. After one major seven, you're gonna play the four major seven chord. All right, after that, you're gonna play the three minor seven chord. In this case, it would be A minor seven, all right? After that, what you're gonna do is you're going to play the six minor seven. Although with this, it's gonna be in second inversion, which means that the fifth is gonna be at the root for D minor seven. After you play this, you're gonna to go to the two minor seven. In this case, it would be G minor seven. After that, you're going to play five seven, all right? In this case, it would be C seven, and this is an inversion as well, with the fifth and the root. And then after that, you go back to one major seven. So without me talking, it's gonna sound like this. It's gonna sound like that. Now, this chord progression is actually given by Kent Hewitt in one of his videos where he talks about improvisations and jazz. This is completely dedicated to his video and all credit goes to him for coming up with that. I really like that progression and I use that even to this day after learning it so that can be something that you guys can have fun with in whatever key you want to use it in. So after getting that chord progression and hearing me talk about improvise, you're probably thinking to yourself, well how do I improvise in jazz? I don't know that. So essentially the second rule, the second principle that we're going to talk about has to do with improvisation. And that second rule is simply that when you improvise in jazz, you're improvising in the key of whatever your chord progression is in. All right, pretty simple. So with that chord progression that we talked about, one, four, three, six, two, five, seven, one. If we take that, that means that we can improv in the key of F using the key of F, all right? Now, to keep this as simple as possible, what I'll do, I won't even improvise. I'll just play the scale of F along with this chord progression so you can kind of get a feel for how it fits with the chord progression, all right? So here I go. So as you guys can see, it completely fits in with that chord progression. So whether you want to play just the scale and change up the rhythm like a lot of people do, right? Or if you want to just arpeggiate it like some people do. And as you can see, that one's a little bit trickier. Even I had some uh, issues with that, but it sounds good, you know? Hopefully you guys can see that we're getting a lot of jazz out of just these first two principles of adding extensions to chord progressions and improvising in the key of whatever we're playing, whatever chord progression we're using. So those are the first two progressions, and now we can move on to the next principle, the third principle, which is something that I used just now when I was using the arpeggiated example. And that would be using dotted eighth notes as opposed to normal eighth notes. So basically, if we had a normal eighth note, which is played two times per beat, it would be like this. Right? 
two for each beat. However, if it's a dotted eighth note, it's going to be more of a long, short, long, short, long type sound like this. Right? That's basically how swing originated. You're swinging the eighth notes by dotting them and making them unequal. That gives it a very, very jazzy sound. So if I were to take just the scale from the first example and the second principle, and I were to use dotted eighth notes, it makes a big difference, all right? So this is it without the dotted eighth notes. Now, if we were to add in those dotted eighth notes, it would sound like this. All right, it would sound like that. Now, hopefully you guys can hear that that is a huge, huge difference in making it a lot jazzier. And keep in mind, I'm not even improvising. I'm just playing the scale up and down. I may... Uh, go below F to an E before I start back on the scale or something like that. But by no means am I improvising. I'm just using the principles that we've talked about so far, adding extensions, making sure that you improvise in the key, and making sure with the third principle that you dot those eighth notes and you make them long, short, long, short, long. goes a big, big way in how you can make something a lot jazzier. Right? So that's pretty simple. Uh, I feel like I don't need to spend a lot of time on that. The fourth principle that we're going to talk about is the syncopation principle. All right? So basically for people who aren't familiar with syncopation, syncopation can best be described by talking about a note that's being played on an offbeat. All right? So if we're talking about a beat, I'll snap out a beat. Playing on beat would sound like this. Something like that, right? Now, if I play on the off beats, I'm playing on the hidden beat between my snaps. So instead of playing on the beat like that, I'm playing like this. Something like that, right? So if we were to incorporate that into our progression, there's a complex way and there's a simple way to do it. So the complex way would be to play your chords on those offbeats like I was talking about. So if I were to snap in a four uh, count measure before we start, see how I'm playing, I'm on the offbeats, offbeat. That would be the first way to do it that's pretty complex because it's a little bit hard to improvise over. You really got to be steady with your rhythm as you improvise over that, making sure that you do that. A simpler way to do it, which I tend to do because I wouldn't consider myself a good jazz pianist by any means, is to simply play it on the beat, start your chords on the beat, but play it once more on the offbeat before you move to the next chord. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to play the chord on one, beat one, which is a strong beat, but what we're going to do is we're going to play it again on the and of three. All right. So if we're counting out a four bar rhythm, we're saying one, two, three, four. But if we count including the eighth notes, it would be one and two and three and four and something like that. If we were counting out 16th notes, we'd say one E and a two E and a three E and a something like that, right? So while doing that, we can see that one and two and three and four and there's an and after each strong beat. We're gonna play it on the and that's counted right after beat three. All right, so how that's gonna work out is that's gonna work out like this. One and two and three and four 
and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one. See how I did that? So one, two, three and four and one, two, three and four and one. That is a lot simpler. Um, by no means is it simple because once you improvise, you really have to lock in your internal metronome, making sure that you can improvise and hit that syncopation in the left hand in time. But at least it's simpler in the fact that you're giving yourself the strong beat for each measure before you go on. That can kind of help your internal metronome, you know, be a little bit more accurate as you keep playing, right? So if I were to play the scale along with those syncopations playing on the and after three and on one, it would sound like this. Now, if you play just that, how many of your friends would be like, oh my gosh, you learned jazz, right? It does make a really big difference. And hey, for fun, let's go ahead and let's transition that into the key of C because we've been on F for a while. So if I were to do that in the key of C, this is what the progression would sound like. same type of deal and hey as you're practicing this one smart thing that I would recommend doing is transitioning from C to F or any other keys that you might know and be familiar with so doing that it would sound like this and then go to F Very, very, very jazzy. Very jazzy, all right? Awesome. So that is basically the fourth principle, which is adding some syncopation in. So to kind of recap, we've talked about sevenths, making sure that you add major sevenths. So that's the first principle. The second principle is going to be that our improvisations in our right hand are going to be in the melodies, in the keys for what we're playing. So if we're playing in the key of C, we're going to stay in the key of C as we improvise, right? That's second principle. Third principle is they're going to, uh, bleh, I cannot speak today. The third principle is that we're going to dot our eighth notes instead of normal eighth notes. So instead of playing them straight, one and two and three and four, we're going to play them like this. One and two and three and four and one and two and so on and so forth. And the fourth principle is going to be syncopation, where we add in our left hand playing one and then playing them again on the and of three. So one and two and three and one and two and three and one if we're doing them in three, or if we're doing them in four, one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four, and 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 so on and so forth. All right, so now I'm very excited to move on to the fifth and final principle. Now, the fifth and final principle deals with chromatics or chromatic alterations or accidentals, depending on uh, whatever you may have heard them referred as. Now, the reason that I saved it until last as the last principle that we talk about is simply because a lot of people like what they've heard up until now. They don't want a lot of chromatics. They don't want a lot of craziness like bebop, uh, which is a really crazy style of jazz with a lot of chromatic alterations to them. They just want to play something nice, something simple at a slow tempo like this. Right? Right? Uh, to them, that's enough. To them... 
that's all they wanted to get out of learning jazz and they're good so if that's you feel free to stop right now because we will talk about chromatics we will talk about a lot of the diminished chords that we brushed up on at the beginning of the video and that's going to make things a lot more dissonant which may be out of your taste for music so if that's you no hard feelings feel free to you know take what i've talked about review it but if you'd like to learn about chromatics and how to play it at a little bit of a faster tempo or something feel free to keep watching so with the fifth rule of adding chromatics there's two uh, I guess you could say levels to the fifth rule, all right? So the first thing that we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about chromatics as passing tones. Now, chromatics as passing tones, for those of you who aren't familiar with passing... Blah, I still can't speak. <laughs> for those of you who are unfamiliar with passing tones, basically passing tones can be described as notes that you play going to another note. So let's say that I'm playing an F major 7 and I want to play an F in the right hand. What I can do is I can, instead of just playing F, I can use G as a passing tone like that. I'm passing by G to get to F. If I wanted to add a chromatic alteration to it, I could add in F sharp as I'm going from G to F, so it sounds like this, right? And you could hear that in an improvisation. Right? Something like that. So as a passing tone, chromatics in jazz really give it the next level of jazziness, quote unquote. I need to count how many times I've used that term. But it really does make it kind of to the next level of the genre, right, as passing tones. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, what do I use chromatics for passing tones? Uh, there's a lot of different ways to use passing tones as chromatics, and uh, Kent Hewitt, the guy who I mentioned before, also makes a lot of videos about passing tones and some of the chromatic ways that you can use passing tones. One of them is kind of like what I did, where you just do that and land on a chord tone. Now, just on an off-related note, uh, anytime you're improving, always landing on chord tones is a good idea. So if you're improving and you want to make something stick as you change from chord to chord, land on a chord tone. So if I'm going from F to B flat, major seven, see how I landed on the chord tone of B flat? Any chord tone will work for pretty much what you're using in your left hand. Always looking at what you're playing in the left hand is a good way to determine what you would want to land on. So in this case, F, A, C, E. If I land on F, A, C, E, that'll sound good. And using chromatic passing tones to get to those chord tones is what I was trying to get to. You could do that. If you want to land on A, you could do that. If you want to land on C, and if you wanted to land on E, any of those would work, right? Um, what starts to get you in kind of some, what's the right word? What starts to sound really unjazzy and more like you're messing up is when you land on the chromatics themselves, right? To a lot of people, that doesn't sound jazzy. Although it may for you. But what I'm doing is instead of pl uh, playing chord tones, I'm moving up to F sharp major. And I'm using chromatic passing tones to get to those. A lot of people wouldn't like that. A lot of people would find it much more pleasant to hear you land on chord tones, right? And I tend to agree. So whenever you're using chromatics as passing tones, you can do that as a little three note type deal. Or what you can do is you can do the two half steps to the right and left of it before you land on it. That's another thing that Kent Hewitt talks about. So instead of going or, what we can do is we can do the note to the right and immediate left of F before we hit it. So what we, we can do is we can do this. Same thing with A. Same thing with C. 
See what I'm doing? I'm taking a half step up and a half step down from our target note, which in this case is F, and I'm playing them before I hit it. You know, just things like that. So those are some ways to use chromatic passing tones, excuse me, as you're improvising. See, a lot of chromatic passing tones. So that's one way that you can see chromatic passing tones to use them as passing tones to get to a target note. And for a lot of people, if you listen to jazz improvs or you listen to a jazz musician play over a jazz standard, you'll hear a lot of passing tones that do that. And the reason I think that a lot of people do that is because it keeps it very consonant, the opposite of dissonant. It keeps it sounding really major and nice while giving you that flair of chromaticism, but it doesn't make the chromaticism, the, it doesn't give it the spotlight, if that makes sense, you know? So that's one way to use chromaticism. And as you noticed, when I was using passing tones with chromaticism, I was doing it on a chord that is also very consonant, right? So major seven chord, major seven chord, minor seven chord, minor seven chord, you know, uh, probably the most dissonant chord in the progression that we've been working with is probably the 5-7. So moving into the second level of using chromatics, the more dissonant your chord is that you're basing off of, the more chromatics that you can use. That That's a good general rule uh, to use as you're improving. So let's go and let's take a look back at our chord progression and let's try to give more chromatics as we hit the 5-7 chord. So obviously... Right, something like that. Give it a few more chromatic notes, you know. Um, that is a good principle to follow. Now... The question to ask is, what is the most dissonant chord that we looked at? And if we kind of review way back to the beginning of the video, we have the major seven chord. We have this chord, which is just a normal seven chord, dominant seven chord. Uh, and that's, you know, dissonant, but let's keep going. Obviously minor seven is very jazzy, but I wouldn't say. Um, it's very dissonant, although it definitely gives off that vibe. Ah, now we're starting to get into some real dissonance, right? The diminished chords, level one diminished. And then if we want to really make it as dissonant as possible, make it fully diminished, right? And if you remember, fully diminished chords are used a lot in jazz because it's very dissonant and you can use the most amount of chromatics when working with dissonant chords, right? So essentially the kind of principled thing to remember is that if you're playing a very, very dissonant chord, like a fully diminished chord, you know, you can do whatever you want in terms of chromatics. And to demonstrate that, what I'll do is I will change the progression that we've been working with to include a lot of diminished seven chords, and then we're going to have some fun with it. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take the chord progression. We're going to keep the major 7. So we're going to keep F major 7. We're going to keep 4 major 7. We're going to keep this, but remember how this is kind of crunchy. I mean, if you look, we the middle two notes are right beside each other. We'll change that to B instead of this. We'll change it to be A fully diminished. Yeah, getting real jazzy. Then we'll keep this, but instead of doing this, it's already, you know, pretty dissonant. So we can change it to that, all right? So now let's hear it with the changes that we made. And heck, after that, let's throw in another diminished. So... 
what we'll do now that we've established that is we'll try to kind of show off to what level chromaticism can be used with those chords. And what I'll do is I'll still play the major, you know, scale of F when we keep those consonant chords, but whenever I play a diminished, I'm just gonna play a chromatic scale. I'm gonna do that, all right? Because that is uh, the most chromatics you can get is just going down fly to the bumblebee style, all right? So let's see how that sounds if I do that. Right, getting our first All right let's try it in C and see how it sounds in C no pun intended All right and then we'll do a diminished chord back in C another diminished chord and now we're back all right let's do it in E flat all right sounds pretty jazzy and doing it this way, adding all those chromatics in is something that can take it even more to the next level than just adding in passing tones. And that's something to practice, mixing in passing tones and doing a bunch of crazy chromatic stuff that you see a lot of people doing when they perform jazz. Um, one thing that can help you, I'll go ahead and kind of throw in some, some bonus principles and bonus tips to use. There is a diminished scale to use that a lot of jazz pianists use. So basically, if we take a C fully diminished scale, it's it's a C chord. It's a C fully diminished chord. So we'll start on C when we're playing the scale. And basically how the scale goes is you're going to go half step, whole step, half step, whole step, half step, whole step until we get back to C, right? So if we take that half step, whole step, half step, whole step, Half step, whole step, half step, whole step. So those are the scale, those are the keys to use right there, right? So if you're playing a chord progression and you play this, that's something that you can use. You'll hear bits and pieces of that as you listen to. So if you mix in just a chromatic scale with you can get some really really cool stuff um another thing that you can do is you can lose what's called the super locrian scale and what the locrian scale is by itself is it's going to be a mode built off of a major scale so if we take c the key of c and we play the key of C, but instead of going from C to C, we go from B to B. That's the Locrian scale. And you can hear how jazzy it sounds before you get back. It, it sounds like something that you can really use with a diminished scale. You know to get some really cool sounds. What you can do though is you can take the Locrian scale and you can actually flat the third. So one, two, three. Instead of going here, what we're gonna do is we're going to flat it. Kind of give it almost a uh, melodic minor feel. So that's another tool that you can use. So those are all the principles that you can use. So to give a quick recap of how far we've come using all these principles, stacking them on top of each other, the first is that, again, we want to use a lot of sevenths or even sixes. And we'll go and we'll do E flat um, to start with. So lots of sevenths, lots of sixes, 
Uh, even normal sevenths will work. Dominant sevenths will work because in the example that I gave, five seven can go back to one in a really cool way in terms of a theory perspective. So that's the first one. That's the first rule to add sevenths, sixes, all that type of stuff to a normal chord progression to give it a jazzier sound. To improv over it, use melodies that fit within the key of whatever you're trying to do. So we're sticking in a scale, in a key. Third, use dotted eighth notes instead of normal eighth notes. So instead of going one and two and three and four, do this. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one. All right. Going into fourth principle, good segue, just what I was doing right there, play a lot of syncopations. A lot of syncopations in the left hand will go a very far way. Fifth principle with chromatics, use a lot of passing tones if you're playing consonant chords. If you want to use even more chromatics, Add in as many diminished chords as humanly possible. And that'll get you very, very far places. Um, if you want to use a scale, the Locrian scale, is a good thing to use with a fully diminished scored. And also what you can do is you can use the diminished scale, which is starting at whatever tone you're using. Half step, whole step, half step, whole step, half step, whole step, half step, whole step. And there you go. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, I had a lot of fun making it, a lot of fun improving. I know it was a lot different than what I usually do. If you guys like these tutorials, let me know. If you guys have any ideas of what you would want me uh, to teach you more about, if you feel like you would benefit from me making a video that goes a little bit more in depth with some of the theory stuff that I was talking about, scale degrees, keys, um, anything like that, let me know down in the comments because I definitely enjoy making these tutorials and I can't wait to see what you guys think about this video and what suggestions you guys come up with for the next one. So I hope you guys have an amazing day, an amazing week, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.